This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. Welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky and I'm sitting here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Don't lie to them. You're lying there. I know. I'm lounging in the recently air-conditioned podcast studio. Oh boy. No more complaining about the heat. No, if else? anything, our nips are erect. I know. And I will be complaining about that. <laughs> I will be writing to HR about that. About the nips. Yeah, the nip sitch. It's out of control. Matt's are insanely long. Matt, you're like poking me in the eye. Yeah. And we're on the other side of the table, but one eight, we've got a nip each, oh, both of them. I know. How are you controlling them separately? You're like a swordfish. Oh, wow. Swordfishes have long nipples. Yes. <laughs> huh. Little known fact. Didn't know that. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of David Attenborough, and that's what I learned. <laughs> the swordfishes. Nipples. I'm poking my eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> how is everyone? I'm, I'm good. We never ask that. And I think maybe we should. A little bit of a check-in. Matt, how are you? I'm okay. I'm just, yeah. Does anybody want to ask how I am? Oh, right, oh. right. Jesus well, Christ. Well, b- before we get into the report, I should say that we've got a couple of live shows coming up. <laughs> <laughs> how are you, Jess? Fuck off. Live shows coming up. It's going to be fun. No tension in the room, that's for sure. <laughs> we've got some live shows coming up, including one this Sunday afternoon in Adelaide for the first ever time. I'll be there. Jess will be there. Matt will be there. Will you be there? Radelaide. Come on down. It's your first and last opportunity to see us in Adelaide. That's right. We are never coming back. This could be it. This could be it. At the national. This is definitely it. All right. Th- Michael Jackson, this is it. <laughs> Meaning we could die before we put on any of the shows. Wow. Which is what happened to him. Oh, I take that back. Also, do not accept weird drug to- cocktails from your doctor. Oh, what? Oh, that is such a good call. Between now and Adelaide. Okay, after, after that, <laughs> let's party. <laughs> Sunday night in Adelaide, my doctor will be uh, dosing us up. The doctor is in. (laughs) Uh, But it's uh, in the afternoon at the National Wine Centre. Please do come along. Yeah, we'd love to have you there. Be be good fun. Matt will also be in Adelaide before and after that and during with his live show, Bone Dry. That's right. It's going to be real fun. Can't wait to get to Adelaide now. Am I there yet? I'm there already, actually. I've been there since... The first show was on Saturday. Oh, what? And it went great. I nice can only one. assume. I'm proud. We're recording this just before I'm leaving. But I feel positive. We're opening on yeah. Saturday night. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Big dogs uh, <laughs> open on the big dog night. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Tuesday night. No, thank you. Yeah. That's what I did in Perth, admittedly. But still, <laughs> it's a new me. <laughs> New city, new me. Yeah, All right. I love that. Yeah. And now we are in March. We can say that at the end of this month, we've got the Melbourne International Comedy Festival kicking off where we are doing four live podcasts every Saturday afternoon from March 30th, the first one at the European Beer Cafe, especially the first one selling very, very well. So if you want to get into that one or get a season pass, I'd get on it soon. Other three also selling well. We'd love to see that. Yeah. Come on down. It's the most wonderful time of year. I love it. It's the best. The city is alive. And we come out of the woodworks. Ooh, we scurry on out. We scuttle. We scuttle out of the woodworks. Ooh, what have we been working on? Uh, b- boat. <laughs> oh, a boat. Yeah. Boat. I'm making a boat. Comedy boat. Comedy boat. We scuttle out of the woodwork of the comedy boat. Comedy boat. And then we, <laughs> we perform for you. Uh, we, we dance for you, maybe, mm. presumably. I'll sing at some point, probably. I'll hum something at some yeah. point, and probably. Then, yeah, probably. And then we scuttle back into the woodwork. And like we've been saying, we'll only, we won't be releasing all these, so if you want to hear them all, you've got to be in the room. Yeah, you got to be there. That's true. Or be square. Yeah. Or maybe be on Patreon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> the three options right there. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we announced a couple of weeks ago that we're going to Thailand for the Koh Samui International Podcast Festival in June with the Little Dum Dum Club. Some podcasts live on the beach in Thailand in a tropical paradise. What yeah. a wild thing to look forward it's to. crazy. I haven't got my head around any of that yet. Adelaide and Koh Samui. <laughs> <laughs> we really can have it and, all. I mean, we're also we're looking into, obviously, the American stuff still we're looking into and uh, other places like Perth and Brisbane. We're going to mm. be coming around to all of you all real soon, hopefully. Yeah. 
That is absolutely right. Real soon, hopefully. Right on. Well, with that... We're not committing to anything. Yeah, with that huge <laughs> commitment and 100% con- confirmation for all <laughs> the people not in Adelaide or Kosamui, let's get on with this week's episode. Matt, you're doing a report. Yes. You're looking good. You're looking so calm and casual about this one. I I feel I feel bad. I well I should say there'll be people anyway, let's get the topic out of the way and then I can um give my apologies. pre apologies. <laughs> this this one was a free choice for you. M- Jess and I are on the Patreon votes at the moment. Yeah. So Patreon chooses what we out of some uh, some options. But you, free range of the hat, you can pick anything. That's right. And that sometimes is actually worse. I've spent hours looking at it before yeah. going, is this good enough? Is this what I want for my free choice? Free yeah. choice. It's an exciting. I can do anything. I can do anything. <laughs> no. I can't think of anything that I want to do. <laughs> no. It's difficult. It's so hard. But I, I, I've definitely made a good choice. I just don't know if I've um, if I've done it justice or not. But let's find out together. I reckon you have. I'm gonna, I'll ask you the question and then um, we can... Get stuck into the old rapport. You beauty. Question is, following reports on the Beatles and Pantera, which band would complete a do-go-on trilogy of my favourite ever bands? Oh, now hang on, Dave. This, okay, this so is we've had serious, the Beatles. Mum. We've had Pantera. <laughs> and do we have a report on Tism? It is a report yes! on Tism. Yes. <laughs> I want to point out to whoever is... Uh, keeping track of who gets it right, I did just get it right. You did so because right. Tism possibly stands stands for this is serious, mum. Yes, which I right. imagine we'll get to. But point for you, Jess. Well done. This is exciting. This is a my parents will definitely listen to this. And is this in in order? Is it the Beatles, then Pantera, then Tism, or do you know mm. your top three? No, I think it would it would fluctuate around those. I think Tism would definitely be. I think it's probably I don't know. It's hard to say, but Tism are definitely way right up there. Top three for sure. <laughs> Uh, it's been suggested quite a few times, um, including by McFarty. In brackets, it's Dutch, I know, ha-ha. <laughs> um, That's my dream name. Oh, you could marry them and become oh Jess McFarty. Oh, my God, I want to be Jess McFarty. <laughs> that is comedy. Also, Nicola Not has McFarty. suggested it. Steve, what a one name is here. Hi, Steve. <laughs> uh, and Jacob Lane. Awesome. So Jacob thank you, Lane. everyone, for those suggestions. You should have saved McFarty for last, though, because all the others sound Jacob lame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm sure that's a flashback to his childhood. Yeah, 100%. Um, this is what Steve said. He said, this is serious, Matt. Dave <laughs> delivered The Simpsons. Bob gave us Riverdance. Shudders. Complete the oh, triptych. That uh, was unnecessary. No, Shudders because they, he loved it? It gave yeah. him chills. Yeah, chills <laughs> down my... Line. Well, it feels like Michael Flatley is dancing on my spine right now. So I imagine that there's probably a few Tism fans who are tuning in for the first time. Uh, and I should say to you, you you're not going to learn anything new, I don't think. So I apologize for that. Um, I uh, I love this band. Mm. I want to do them justice. I probably haven't. Something I would say to listeners is go out and listen to some of their albums. Not available on Spotify, but you can find them on YouTube or iTunes. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, here is my report. Tism which is short for This Is Serious Mum, formed sometime in the early 1980s, probably 1982. They evolved out of the band I Can Run. Their first concert occurred on the 6th of December 1983 at the Duncan McKinnon Athletics Reserve in the Melbourne suburb of Murrumbina. <laughs> uh, when I read this the first time, when I, I got way into him, like maybe late 90s, early 2000s, mm. And I did a lot of reading on, you know, the primitive internet back then. Yeah. And when I read that, I got chills. I sh- I shuddered with delight yeah. because that is where I did my uh, school sports. Yeah, Duncan McKinnon. At Duncan McKinnon Reserve. It's not too far from where you guys grew yeah, up. Yeah, and my like my, my mum, the school mum works at, uses it all the time. <laughs> so it's wild. Uh, I never did sports. Oh, Duncan McKinnon well. <laughs> so I think it's funny that I came fourth in the 1,500 metres at the same place. <laughs> Tism first performed. That is. Wow. How yeah. many kids were running in the race? I think that, you know, there was at least four, probably eight to ten. Hello. Maybe 12. Okay. Maybe okay. six. There's not that many. Do you get a ribbon for fourth? Yeah, you might have. I think fourth was the old the white, white ribbon. The white ribbon, yeah. Oh. The colour of surrender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give up. Yeah. Just give up. 
It almost feels like a Tism sort of uh, lyric. I, I came forth in the 1500 metres at the same place to some first performed. I reckon they could make that work. Yeah, yeah. somehow they'd work that in there. Uh, the band saw the concert as an ab- abject failure and split up immediately <laughs> uh, before reforming a couple of months later. So Tism Law states that every subsequent gig over the following 20 odd years was a reunion show. <laughs> so they broke up after every show. Every show? They were, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Band members, this may be the most famous thing about them to casual observers. Band members hid their identities with face masks and pseudonyms. And so, do they do that at the, this first concert yep. in Marambina? They wore um, newspaper costumes. Wow. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> the original four members of the band included vocalist Humphrey B. Flaubert, which is a play on uh, the name of the children's TV character Humphrey B. Bear, who's an Australian TV character, and 19th century French novelist. Gustave Flaubert. <laughs> Flaubert. That's right. Um, and this is kind of something they do a lot of, mixing high culture and low culture ideas, sort of their, one of their trademarks. Uh, keyboardist Eugene de la Hot Croix Bun, or Hot Crocs Bun, maybe, which is a play on the French romantic artist Eugene de la Croix and the Easter baked treat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then and the other two original members were bass player Jock Cheese, which probably doesn't need too <laughs> much explanation. Obviously, uh, mixing high and low <laughs> culture there. And vocalist Genre Be Good, who's the Johnny Be Good <laughs> thing. Uh, Genre Be Good left the band before they released an album or anything. Uh, apparently, he left because he had a complete non sellout stance, possibly down to even not selling albums. He's just like <laughs> very. Very staunch in his beliefs of not selling out. So that made obviously being in a band pretty hard. Like, I don't want to sell out so badly that I cannot be in a band. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, and another band member have since, has since been quoted as saying, this stance was simultaneously stupid and inspiring to the rest of the band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, potentially to mock him for this stance, the band ended up naming their record label after him, Genre Be Good. <laughs> so on, on most of their CDs on the back it says Genre Be Good. Um, joining the band soon after, in the first couple of years, uh, was guitarist Leek Van Vlahelen, John St. Penis, <laughs> uh, Les Miserables, and which is obviously a play on Les Mis, Les Mis and vocalist Ron Hitler Barassi. Um, <laughs> Ron Barassi being an all time great Aussie rules footballer, and you might know uh, Hitler's work. Um, <laughs> Apparently, personally, no. Apparently, he took his name um, from his German heritage as mixing with his love of Aussie rules football. Um, so, kind of the core, the the two faces of the band, are, um, Humphrey B. Flaubert and Ron Hitler Barassi, mainly. Most interviews and everything, it's normally them working as a duo. And so, I track down interviews with them. They're so funny, so quick, and mm. um, yeah, a whole lot of fun. But obviously, there's it's a very collaborative band. Um, everyone wrote songs and, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, like I was saying, the anonymity thing is probably the first thing that comes to mind for casual fans. Uh, when talking about the hidden identities in recent times, though, Flaubert said, let's face it, it's totally unoriginal. The residents did it long before we did, and before the residents, I'm sure there was someone else. It allows people to compare us to Kiss and to Slipknot, and we obviously have more in common with Kenny G than any of those bands. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, they've always, yeah, they're a funny band because they've obviously got a lot of self-belief. They know they're very good and funny and, and whatnot, but they will also self-deprecate mm. pretty mercil- mercilessly. <laughs> uh, they have never officially revealed their identities and this led to regular speculation about who they actually are, especially in, at the peak of their fame in the 80s and 90s. Um, rumours went around that they were politicians or members of other bands. Um, there was strong rumours that they were f- uh, members of the band Painters and Dockers and also the Wiggles. I think that was more of a, a <laughs> joke rumour. But um, due to the fact that they mainly toured during school holidays, a persistent rumour was that they were school teachers. And I think that did end up being true. I think at least, I'm pretty sure. A couple yeah, of them were, yeah. Of them were. Uh, due to them often referencing football players, there was also a rumour that they were AFL footballers. <laughs> That'd be great. And responding to that theory, Humphrey B. Flaubert stated that we're actually not AFL, we're more violent and crappy. So you're looking at VFL there. <laughs> um, perhaps surpri- unsurprisingly, they were often asked why they chose to remain anonymous. One time when Flaubert was asked, he answered, the answer that makes me sound good is that we desire to circumvent the cult of personality that is inherent in rock music by choosing to remain anonymous. 
Unlike every other band in rock, we choose to be anonymous. The answer that makes me sound good would probably also incorporate some lengthy discussion about Brechtian alienation <laughs> techniques, about our postmodernist grasp of ever cooling universe and a dehumanizing society encapsulated in the somewhat paramilitary aspect of our clothing. All of those things would make me sound good, <laughs> but actually we're just boring guys. I think the, the stories all were always bigger than the reality and I guess that would have been amusing when you're going, um, where there's a teacher, he works for... Yeah, yeah, right. He's a PE teacher. <laughs> yeah. I do English, and then uh, Trevor works at the local petrol station. Um, oh, Jock Cheese. Jock Cheese is a bass player, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, he also went to school with my dad. Right. He was a, a very close family friend. <laughs> can't believe that you know Jock Cheese. Jock Cheese. Jock Cheese. I think, well, that's confusing because there's, there's, there's a Jock. I think your dad, if I remember right, your dad uh, went to school with Tony Coitus. No. No, okay, great. He went to school with James Paul. James Paul, that's right, who is Tony jo- Coitus. Jo- oh. Or Token Blackman, he was changing. Because I just Black. asked mum, I just messaged her and I was like, what was, because his name, his name was James Paul, but his friends called him Jock. Jock, that's right. But then, there, so that's why people get confused because there's Jock Cheese. Yeah. His real name isn't. But then I, I, I just asked, sorry, I, this, is an unreli- this isn't helpful, but I asked mum what his name was in the band because I didn't think it was Jock Cheese. And she said, good question. She's not 100% sure, but she said he was the bass player. Does that help? Right. And I said, oh, yes, interesting. it does. Okay. <laughs> see, this, I'm, it's like she's texting now, so we'll see. It's very exciting. I, I believe he was the guitarist, but I think they played, I think they Probably might have switched both. between the bass and guitar, um, Jock, Tri- Jock Cheese and uh, Token Blackman, a.k.a. Tony Coitus, a.k.a. James Paul. Right. Um, I trust you more than mum's well, I mean, recollection I'm, of the early 80s. I'm also going off, you know, I, I never... The identities and stuff, it yeah. was never something I was I, – I always sort of felt like that was part of the fun. I didn't want to, like, no, go in and yeah. do hunting. Yeah. It didn't really matter to me exactly who they were. Yeah. So I, ignoring... I just liked the music mainly and, and thought they were really fun and funny. Yeah. As well as their songs just being fucking bangers. Oh, they're great. But all my memories of Jock was that he always had a guitar. Right. There was, he was be at our house. Apparently classically guitar. trained. Incredibly. He went to – he went overseas uh, – where was he? Berlin? No, somewhere like that. And he wrote all sorts of classical, incredible music. He also did a song uh, which Shane Jacobson did the <laughs> vocals for. Really? Not Shane Jacobson. Yeah, no. Kenny? No. Shane. Shane. Warren. Shane Warren, Shane Crawford. Shane, Shane Gould? Thank God you're here. Who oh, is it? Um, Shane. Shane Bourne. Bourne. Shane Bourne. Oh. Yes. That's a weird combo. Yeah, yeah it I'm, is. That was not the Shane I was expecting. No, I was really Shane Jacobson Shane... was incorrect also. Was really I'm expecting... not helping this at all. <laughs> I was really expecting Shane Warren to come up there. I'll stop contributing. Please, Please. go on with the no, report. No, well, you're, you're the, you've got the most direct. So he, he hung out at your house. Yeah, I knew him very well growing up. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, he was uh, one of Dad's best friends and Mum's. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> one of my parents' best friends. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he, as yet, he hasn't joined the band. He joined in the early 90s, but I'll get to that in a sec. By the mid-80s, the band were playing regularly around Melbourne, and in 1986 they released their debut single, which was called Defecate on My Face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a song sung from the perspective of Adolf Hitler to his mistress, uh, mistress Eva Braun, <laughs> um, which references the rumours that Hitler was into, into scat. <laughs> Basic Hitler. That's Scar, man. Oh, sorry. Right. Get it right. Uh, Scar. The, the song had uh, lyrics, so, you know, mixing in uh, Nazi war history with um, shit. With poo- I mean, that sounds like something you'd love because you love poo jokes. <laughs> well, I'd, for some reason I enjoy this one, but uh, <laughs> the song opens by saying, Come home tired, what a day I've had. News ain't good from Stalingrad. I've been busy protecting the German race, so come on, baby, defecate on my face. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, uh, get to the bunker, looks like a sty, turn on the TV, it's all one big lie. Here, Eva, have these prunes to chew. We have ways of making you poo. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I know this song, I know the chorus, but I do not, I had no idea that that's what the verses were. 
Yeah, so uh, so silly, but so great. It's so well. catchy. Defecate <laughs> on my face. Defecate on my face. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was it. And it sort of it plays it out as if um, the the war. Hitler sort of gave in because uh, this is what it says. Finney goes, "What's that, Evie? Your bowel is on strike. Then it's all over for my Third Reich." Which is it's a different. That's a different <laughs> history lesson. What I was taught in school, but uh, it was released as a seven inch uh, on vinyl, obviously with all four sides of the cover glued shut. <laughs> I mean, you, you couldn't open it to get the album out without destroying the artwork. Um, and they, they would often do this sort of kind of punking or, or pranking their own audience a bit like that. Um, Imagine calling up the distributor and being like, hey, can you print this and can you glue the fourth side shut? Yeah, we need to seal them shut. So Sorry, what? Yes, I know you won't be able to get it out. <laughs> That's the point. What's it called? Defecate on my face. <laughs> no, no, no. It's told from the perspective of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I mean, nothing weird. Oh, come on. Hello? <laughs> uh, due to the lyrical content of the song, it received little to no radio play. Um, though apparently... They couldn't get it out of the cover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it had nothing to do with the yeah. content. <laughs> they mailed it in and people were like, well, obviously there's nothing in here. Yeah. Um, uh, apparently it was a big hit in the clubs, though. It was a big, big, big dance hit. And then in 1987, they released another single called 40 Years Then Death. Um, it's sort of about, about life. It's a pretty sad tale. Um, it was confusingly uh, released in a clear plastic sleeve on a, on a plain disc, so no labelling at all. You couldn't, <laughs> you, it's impossible to tell what it was. <laughs> That's just dumb. It's sort of showing shit. that they're pretty happy to um, fuck around even if it made success harder for themselves. <laughs> and uh, despite this, the song was well-received and got uh, radio support. Their debut album was released the following year, charting in the top 50 in Australia, uh, which is pretty amazing in itself. Um, Considering it can't get much ra- uh, radio play. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but they, there were some radio hits on it, but the, the album was called uh, Great Truckin' Songs of the Renaissance. Like, <laughs> sort of the kind of thing that you'd expect to um, chart high. Uh, the <laughs> it's still seen as a classic today, and it's seen as one of their high points. Although I reckon I, I love every one of their albums, but anyway, they, it is seen as is still a fan favorite. Um, and the a single came off it called Saturday Night Palsy, um, which also charted and led to the band appearing on popular television show Hey Hey It's Saturday. Um, <laughs> Daryl <laughs> Daryl Summers has to introduce Tism. He'd be so confused. Oh, it's as if you've seen it. <laughs> he is so confused. He's re- obviously reading off an auto cue, and then he has to, he sort of does a double take. Well, you didn't have a rehearsal, Daryl? <laughs> yeah. Like, come on. And they were in the costumes? Uh, when they toured, they would usually come up with different elaborate costumes. Uh, over their career, they'd put, like, a, a one tour, they wore big, f- big um, sort of fat suits that made them look like fat cat bankers. Um, <laughs> other suits where their balaclavas made it look like brains were coming out of their heads. <laughs> Or they were sort of like big flower people, or had um, framed artwork of their own balaclavaed faces above them in a in a big frame, like an art, a work of art or big. It would have been so hard to perform. Yeah, like it's like everything about what they did was trying to spend any any money they might make on all this elaborate stuff. Um, so they had all all these different costumes, and even at this early stage, they'd already had a bunch of tours with different costumes. So with this performance, they roped in a bunch of mates and pulled out some of those old costumes that they'd used and flooded the Channel 9 studios with 28 supposed members all performing <laughs> and dancing in unison. So <laughs> one, one version of the band had come out, then another, then another, until the whole place was just <laughs> packed out. Um, it was really – when I first watched it, I assumed it was like using green screens or something. It was kind of confusing – to see so many people dancing like that, but a lot of fun, obviously. <laughs> Apparently, they were never invited back <laughs> for, for that reason or whatever. But um, in 1989, they were set to release their first and what would be their only book called The Tism Guide to Little Aesthetics, uh, which compiled lyrics, interviews, and press releases. But after it was checked by lawyers, uh, it took a further year for it to be released as that to censor much of the book by hand using whiteout and uh, black texters and then sticking censor due to legal advice on each copy. So there was apparently it was just a lot of stuff that would have got um, got them in trouble. Right, so they printed it they and redacted then, it. then got the lawyers to look hand, at it. Hand redacted. And the lawyer's like, you've got to take this out. And they're like, well, we've got thousands of copies. Yeah. 
So that's what, reprint it. Pretty oh. inefficient way of doing it, but yeah. Imagine guess, if you missed one one slanderous sentence. Yeah. Waste not, want not. Um, apparently there are a few uncensored versions out there, and they are worth a lot of money if you go on eBay or something like that. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Their second LP was released via Phonogram Records in 1990, and despite it being a sick album, I really love this album. It's called Hot Dogma. It sold poorly. And they were dropped uh, by the label soon after. In 1991, guitarist Lee Van Vlaalen, uh, now known to be Sean Kelly, left the band and was replaced by your family friend Tony Coitus, a.k.a. James Paul. And apparently the original Les Miserables and John St. Penis were also replaced, only with two guys using the same names, Les Miserables and mm. John St. Penis. Why do you, so why do you reckon that sometimes they brought in a completely new member like a new name, new persona, and sometimes they just kept it. Yeah, I wonder whether they'll guess that, whether it's up to the personality of the person. Mm. Some they're trying to just slip in at the time as if it hasn't happened so they don't change the names. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure why that would be. I imagine that um, because James Paul was like a maybe had a different guitar style, it would have been mm. a, a bit clearer, whereas the other guys were more, they were dancing members, sort of dancing <laughs> and backup vocals. Yeah, stuff, right. So. Yeah. Uh, I think Johnson Penis initially was a saxophonist in the band, the original one, but um, that sort of rock with sax was a bit out of style by the nineties, so wasn't as required anymore. But I reckon every rock band in the in the eighties had a saxophonist <laughs> yeah. for some reason. I blame Bruce Springsteen and the all the other bands, Huey Lewis and the News, mm. uh, all those and the bands. At least yeah. they have a saxophonist and the all the unders. Jess and the Neutral Boys. That's us. When did we talk about that? Was that on a podcast? That was with Naomi. Great. Last week. Yeah. So that would make sense to some people. <laughs> uh, Tism were in, uh, an infamously difficult interview for journalists. They would rarely talk about themselves or answer questions sincerely. Even getting them to sit and talk was hard. In the early days, they insisted on being interviewed by facts only. <laughs> facts a question or facts a reply. Um, at different times, they also these are just a few examples of them being difficult slash funny, depending on your perspective. If you're a journalist, Jess, maybe you'd find these annoying, but it seems like a bit of fun. Depends uh, on how. I mean, you're probably on a deadline, yeah. to be honest, so you probably are like, just answer the questions, please. But you're also, I feel like a lot of them are like, well, this is the story. I'll yeah. just talk about how this was very silly. 100%. It's fascinating. So that one time they, um, they made journalists sit on the opposite side of a football field and with uh, megaphones. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That is so funny. Uh, another time with um, string and cans across a, a big space as well. <laughs> One time they made a Rolling Stone magazine writer meet them in a restaurant, but they, they said they'd only talk to him if he wore full scuba gear. <laughs> And he did. Uh, <laughs> yes. Another time they blind- blindfolded a journalist before taking him to a meat locker. Uh, when the blindfold came off, there were three TISM, supposedly TISM members there to interview, but they weren't real TISM members. <laughs> oh, they were just butchers. <laughs> just butchers in balaclavas. <laughs> hey. Um, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know about this cut of meat? <laughs> <laughs> the butchers have no idea what they're doing there either. They, what? they were also kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> and as a journalist, you'd be like, stop fucking around. Yeah, please. I know you're not a butcher. <laughs> tell me about your music. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a butcher. I can what tell music? you about these tenderloins. <laughs> Uh, ABC.net, there's a, a great article on there that's uh, linked to uh, the J-Files, which is a Triple yes. J series uh, that bi- biographies, biographies, mm. biographizes yes. uh, bands, and they, they did a really good one about TISM. Uh, and off that website it says, whatever form it took, TISM's steadfast refusal to ever play anything straight or give a direct answer became legendary. And even Triple J felt the brunt on occasion. Here's one early fax exchange with Triple J. Uh, so Triple J sent the question, what does TISM like most about Sydney? They said, we love the miles and miles of endless desert and how it's the biggest rock in the world. <laughs> <laughs> There's such shit. Uh, yeah, um, uh, what can people expect at the Sydney show? Well, just the usual. At the Sydney show, there will be a, there will be fun things for all the family. The kiddies can learn about horticulture. There will be rides and games for the older kiddies. And mum and dad will enjoy watching the animal parades and the annual wood chop. And, of course, there will be show bags. <laughs> uh, in 1991, the band signed to iconic independent label Shock Records, 
who re-released great trucking songs as well as an EP called Gentlemen Start Your Egos, which collated a bunch of the band's early tracks uh, that were not yet available on CD. It's, there's a track on that um, EP called uh, T.S. Eliot, He Wanker. Does that mean anything to you, Dave, you book boy? Yeah, book boy. <laughs> hey. T.S. Eliot, wanker, book boy. Oh, no. what's, Put him on the spot. What's he wanker mean? That's something I was hoping. Yeah, there's like many yeah. tism lyrics a little over <laughs> my idiot head. Yeah, because uh, remember, Dave, they combine high culture with Matt's low yeah. culture. <laughs> yeah, so I get half gets, the joke. I he get gets the, the Humphrey B bit. <laughs> you get the flow bear, you know? You know? We meet in the middle. Run on Bovary, yeah. They, they had a, a song later on called What Are Ya? And it, the whole song is kind of like going, you, you're one or the other. What are you? You're a wanker or you're a yobbo? Is it yobbo or wanker? Yeah, yeah, I love that. That's Who's your favourite genius, James Hurd or James, James Joyce? Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right, Googling James Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Matt, I think we know what you are in that equation and I think we know what Dave is. It's fun. I, would, I would have been studying literature at the time mm. probably. That was, that was when I got right in. Who it. is James Joyce? <laughs> I had a vague idea. You know? <laughs> um, so yeah, the that was that was a, I've I've got all, all these albums on CD. So I reckon you know when I'm ready to retire, I sell because I most of them are out of print now. Mm. I reckon I could get like 30, 40 bucks for some of oh these. Oh my god, when Whoa. you're ready to retire, <laughs> yeah. Matt. I really hope the economy has gone to shit by then. <laughs> can, I, can I come and uh, and visit you? Yeah. In, uh, on your yacht. <laughs> yes, I will buy. Uh, a yacht? What with? Oh, well, here is my <laughs> copy of Gentlemen Start Your Egos. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm full. And issue two of the Tism comic book. <laughs> I owe you some change. <laughs> <laughs> Take two yachts. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> so they weren't yet available on CD. So shock. I think often it seems like this is something I didn't really think about, but uh, you'd sign a new deal and they'd buy a lot of your back catalogue re-release. Um, that'd be all part of the fun as well. Um and that seemed to happen a lot. Like band, they'd sign for one record, that uh, label would release a bunch of their old stuff, one or two albums, and then they'd move on again. Right. Um, uh, they also, Shock also released a new CD titled Beasts of Suburban, uh, which featured a track called Father and Son, which is one of my favourites because it uh, relates to me a little bit. It detailed the story of a father and son who would go along to watch the Saints play at Moorabbin <laughs> and see the <laughs> legendary wingman Nicky Winmar combine <laughs> Tony Plugger Lockett. So the chorus oh was Winmar, God. Winmar, Winmar to Lockett. Oh, my God. Beautiful is, song. Is there, That's your childhood. Is there any bigger cross-section of your loves than... That right there. Yeah, I know. It's for, I think this is why they're such a favourite band. Cause yeah. They, they, um, I'd say, I'm joking. Some, I get some of the references. The Saints. I certainly get the uh, footy stuff. It's the Matt's favourite things. The Saints, Tism, and his dad. Yeah, oh, the big wow. three. And your family. Yes. It's all linked in. Yeah. Uh, in 1993, Tism released another EP, this time titled Australia the Lucky Country. Um, I probably will bleep out the last bit of that. So let's just say it's called Australia, the Lucky Country without the re. Yep. Uh, this album was embroiled in... Tism fans will feel, feel um, ripped off for that. But apparently in America saying is quite offensive. <laughs> Dave told me that early on. You'll notice that there's bleeps in the first maybe 15, 20 episodes and then I start biting my tongue. Yeah. But uh, there'll be a few bleeps in this episode because they say <laughs> a bit. <laughs> uh, oh, good luck with that, you yeah, <laughs> Everyone have a go. <laughs> no, I'll save mine. Great. So that you don't know where it is. So you have to listen to the whole episode while you're editing to bleep it. Great. Well, nothing I love more than listening back to me talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a c- <laughs> um, This album was embroiled in controversy and not because of the name, but rather the cover art, which was a koala, cartoon koala sucking on a syringe. Um, which was drawn in the simple childlike style of Australian artist Ken Doan. Oh. Do you know Ken Doan? Yeah. Yes. I think he was quite big in the 80s. Yeah. So sort of very colourful. Yeah. He very did the, Australiana. He did the opening cer- Sydney Olympics opening ceremony oh. logo or there was an artwork, something yeah. related to him. You're welcome for that fact. That's nice a good fact. One. Oh, shut up, Jess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you dumb c- <laughs> Please don't shut up. Uh, the Ken Doan Society. Th- That's the bit you argued with. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> the Ken Doan Society. Thre- Still nothing. <laughs> Neither of you. Matt, Wait, please, which bit? Please do go on. Me calling myself a dumb. C- you're not. That's what I was saying. Don't shut up because you're not. Oh. You've got beautiful opinions and a great uh, aura. 
Okay. <laughs> and, you know, I think you have things to say. Thank hey, you. hey, you're a strong woman. <laughs> you're a, you've got autonomy. Yeah. You've got agency. Yeah. Lean in. I love the Give us your opinion. This finger wiggle. Listen to me when I talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the feminist here. <laughs> I'm giving you advice here. <laughs> that finger wiggle you're adding is really empowering me. No, that, really? that finger wiggle is saying, no, yeah. your place. Stop. <laughs> Shh. 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 And lean in and have your say. Shh. Have your say. Uh, the Ken Don Society threatened legal action and the matter was settled out of court for an undisclosed sum, which Flaubert later described as fairly close to the amount that Radiohead spends on buying friends. <laughs> <laughs> the EP was re-released as censored due to legal advice with artwork depicting Sinead O'Connor tearing up a piece of paper with the TISM logo on it, <laughs> uh, which was doctored from the original, which showed her tearing up a photo of Pope John Paul II for some reason, <laughs> apparently on Saturday Night Saturday Live. Saturday Night Live, yeah. yeah, it was a big deal for her. She got in a lot of shit for that. Yeah, right. Isn't it? That was a different time. Yeah. Right? Because oh, you ripped up a picture of Do you know what she was a, protesting? Yeah. Sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. You're joking. Yeah, now everyone's like, huh. She was right. Huh. That was a very different Yeah, time. but at the time people were like calling for her to be killed and things. People are so dumb. And people. she was something like in her early 20s, so very, very oh young. So yeah, Don't take a stand, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> pipe down until you're old and then who cares. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully by then someone else would have taken that stand. And you can all move on. That, I'm gonna that be... is inspiring. Yeah. That is beautiful sentiment. Inspiring me Thank to shut s- the fuck up. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to spend another 25 years doing nothing. Right. And then, oh, boy, you better believe I'm going to be an activist. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I knew that was wrong all along. <laughs> but I just didn't want to say anything because I was young. Yeah. You know? Oh, I know. That's the issue, right? People were mad that she was young doing something. Yeah. Mm. I'm assuming that's the problem. I, honestly, that probably did come into it. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd reckon that probably was. People, yeah. I find that frustrating. It's like at the very, you talk about America and Australia, are very similar countries, and we talk about freedom all the time. Mm. Lucky country, Australia, you know, land of the free America, but then so angry about certain things happening. Mm. It's like, I think you should be allowed to say that. But anyway, what the fuck do I know? Yeah. Probably edit that out because I do not want to stick my head up, <laughs> get chopped off. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. Matt. You are too young. I never thought I'd say this, but you are too young to be an activist. And I should also say um, that's only if it's an opinion I agree with. <laughs> if, you're, if you're saying something I don't agree with, then you should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, agreed. <laughs> Which is kind of what everyone does. It's so funny. People are like, free speech, but I disagree with that. You should die. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what? What? I'm confused. In 1995, Tism released their third LP titled Machiavelli and the Four Seasons. And this went on to be that's very funny. Their most commercially successful album. Oh, great, Dave! Explain why that's funny. <laughs> yeah, for the people listening, <laughs> they, they've taken the uh, philosopher uh, Machiavelli and combined it with Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. They turned it into a, like a boy band. This is like your domain because it's high culture and puns. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. Yeah, to you, <laughs> uh, Dave's so- like. Well, just reading the back of the says, album, he's like, "This is the best thing ever." He I get that, to the music. and that, and that. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's that's a, a, a big bit, bit of the joy of Tism is gone. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this album went on to be their most commercially successful album, and continuing with their habit of fucking with their audience via album art, the cover makes no mention of Tism. <laughs> um, so it's just it's as if the band is Machiavelli and the Four Seasons. <laughs> And the back of the album also does not give a proper track listing, doesn't give the actual songs. Instead, the album lists the songs as I Love You, Baby. It's track one. Track two, You and Me, Baby Love. <laughs> track three, Baby, I Love You. Track four, Love, Baby You. <laughs> oh, no. uh, it's You I Love, Baby. <laughs> In Love With You, Baby. <laughs> baby, Baby, Baby. Love, Love, Love. <laughs> baby Love. And I L Y B. So do you find it hard to keep track of which songs you really like on that album, even as a big fan? I think, well, one of the things I normally do is they're, they're not one of those bands that hides. The, the track title is usually pretty clear from the chorus, so you'd normally figure it out. But, yeah, track order, you'd be testing me. <laughs> uh, it was funny. The, the first time I remember that being pointed out to me was in a 
lecturer at, at my uh, in my degree, the lecturer um, had slides of the album covers, and he read out that track listing. But they do it in like a like the style of a professor. And finally, <laughs> I L Y B. You see, what they've done there to subvert the genre. Oh, my God. I know what Dave's going to be doing in 20 years' time. I'd love to be a professor. But yeah. you're going to need to get another small man and sit on his shoulders and wear a big trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> you need to, you're going to need to grow a beard just to age you a little bit. I just can't. I know, Dave, but you have to try. I know. I think Dave, technology, beard technology is going to come a long way in the next 20 years. Yeah. Someone gave us a, bun- a packet of fake beards on the UK tour. I can give you one of those. Please. Great. Don't know why I didn't think of that. I put one on straight away. <laughs> didn't give one to Dave. I don't know if I was really drunk or something like that, but I don't remember that happening at all. Yeah, we were a bit drunk. Yeah, that one. I was. <laughs> not me. No, not you. You're yeah, a good no. boy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the album went on to achieve gold status. Uh, and it won the ARIA for Best Independent Release. Holy now, shit. ARIAs are like the Australian Recording Industry Awards, which are like the Grammy, Australian Grammys. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, the Australian, what, do you, what are they called in England again? Brit Awards. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, sure. Yeah. Co- I love where Dave doesn't really know. He'll be like, yeah, yeah, why not? Whatever. They're a bit, to be honest, they're a bit like the Australian like um, MTV Awards. MTV, or something right. Like that. Yeah. Um, They're somewhere between. Yeah. They're not quite Grammys. The Very pointy trophies. Yeah. Great looking trophies. Weirdly pointy. Uh, so it went on to win Best Independent Release. Uh, instead of accepting the award themselves, they sent up Hungarian-born football commentator Les Murray, who was immortalised uh, with their song, What Nationality Is Les Murray? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's my funny. God. He, uh, he went up and he said in English, this is serious, okay. In the immortal words of the great Hungarian centre forward, Nador Hidegutkiti. Um, and then he started speaking in Hungarian. So the crowd was sort of like, yeah. like laughing, oh, this is fun. And then he started speaking in Hungarian, uh, which sort of confused the crowd and they lo- like sort of a- softly applauded without knowing what they were applauding. Oh, God, what um, did he say? So the Australian music industry is all there in the audience. Um, what he's been said has been translated in a couple of different ways. Um, one way was when the revolution comes, <laughs> the music industry will be first to go. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think that sounds like that's probably more likely the accurate one, but I've seen some um, versions of it subtitled this, uh, thusly saying, the music industry is a septic boil on the buttocks of humanity. I hope you all die a horrible death. <laughs> I think it's probably more likely to be the first probably, one. Probably, but that's still great. It's great fun. Mm. Um, this album also included two of the band's biggest singles, including Greg the Stop Sign, <laughs> which was a parody of a road safety ad uh, that was played a lot at the time. And the film clip uh, was shot in part at Moorabbin Football Ground, the Saints' home ground, and included my all-time favourite footballer, Justin Peckett, on an exercise bike. All-time favourite. All-time favourite. Couldn't believe it. <sighs> Huge call. Big All call, time. sure. One of the Wakelands was there as well. Wow. And then a lot of players, like Joshua Kitchen, who's yeah. a player that I don't think many would remember. No, of course I remember Josh Kitchen. <laughs> I don't even think he ever played a game. No, I loved Kitchen. Um, I'd say, oi, tell you where you should be <laughs> in the laundry. Oh, that's good. That's a switcheroo. That's a good switcheroo. Did you ever hear Josh Earl's podcast when he had Daniel Tobias on, the yes, actor and comedian? Yes, he talked and about this song. He talked about that song because he was in the TAC ad that is parodied. So, yeah, if, you, if you're if you into <laughs> oh. uh, Josh Earl's podcast, or if you're not, you should listen to the episode with yeah, Daniel Yeah, look up don't, don't You Know Who I Am in the Daniel Tobias episode, which is, they're all great episodes, but yeah, they're that's, all great. that's a, a really funny story. The, and the album also featured their, probably their most iconic song, which is Never Gonna Be an Old Man River, um, which is more <laughs> commonly known as I'm on the Drug That Killed River Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> so... I'm on the drug, I'm on the drug, I'm on the drug that killed River Phoenix. And how long before, how recently had River Phoenix overdosed and died? I think it was a, a couple of years. So it's right. 95. I think he might have died in 95. I wasn't allowed to listen to Tism. Right. Uh, even though, even with one member coming over for dinner. All the time. Yeah, um, right. My brother did. Uh, he he listened to them a lot, but he's quite a bit older than me. I was very little. Right. And I haven't listened to heaps now as an adult, to be fair, but um, I definitely know that one. The song, it really did break through because I remember 
being in primary school when it came out and like us singing it together and getting in trouble from teachers. <laughs> Because so, you're singing I'm on the drug that killed river food. Without, with absolutely zero understanding of what all the words meant. Um, both of these songs were huge hits for them and both finished in the top ten of that year's Triple J Hottest 100. So they were... Damn. Because when you said before that they didn't get a lot of radio play because of the language, yeah, I was like, hey, we play them. Like we, we play all sorts of swear words. Right. Oh, yeah. So can. Triple J is, I'm, was probably more talking about more mainstream. No, radio, totally. But, but I was just, no, no, but I just, I was wondering if we did. Yeah. You so we, they made it into the hottest 100. That's them, really cool. Yeah, quite a lot. Um, obviously. So they, they um, yeah. there was actually a recently you would have seen or you would have seen at your work that mm. they did a re vote for, or maybe Double J did, did a re vote for the 98 hottest 100. Yeah. And a Tism song, What Are You, what we were talking about before. Got bumped up from the forties to number four. Oh, so oh, wow! Yeah, so it's really increasing That's a big leap. popularity. Uh, so uh, the hottest one hundred is a, a yearly countdown that Triple J do uh, of the hottest one hundred songs of that year, of the previous yes. year. We've done a full report on it. We did early oh, yeah, on. Yeah, we did too. <laughs> it's funny. I was talking to some listeners in Perth, and I was, uh, they were saying how they liked the killer episodes. And I'm like, show's really changed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I remember the early days, we weren't picking killers. That was only when we were starting to take suggestions. Yeah. I'm like, well, they were pretty innocent early on and, and their their point of reference was, yeah, like the hottest 100. Yeah. yeah. Or the Sydney Olympics opening ceremony. <laughs> yeah. That was cute. It was a different time. We were such naive kids back yeah, then. Yeah, the Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Adorable. Why is it famous? Okay, but then episode 10. That's true. That's yeah. be- uh, death, burial, Cremation, what can you do with your body when you die? That, yeah, that was a pretty morbid and still my favourite. Great episode. They Disney pack photo. your ass with cotton. It's gross. <laughs> I think that's what made the episode, the packing of your ass. <laughs> we couldn't get past it. <laughs> Funnily enough. Um, as well as being their most well-known song, I, I reckon just the name is, they must have taken the day off when they came up with Never Gonna Be an Old Man River. Because <laughs> it's in brackets too. Yeah, Never Gonna right. Be. So Old brackets. Man River is like a stand, a classic standard. That Old, old Man, man River. river. So, so having, I just, I imagine they would have just like had a, a nap for a week or two. Oh, yeah. It's just great. down. All right, to the pub. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but as well as being the most well-known song, it was also possibly their most controversial uh, with the chorus repeating the line, I'm on the drug that killed River Phoenix. Um, many found it to be in poor taste. Possibly most famously, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the bass player from the Chili Peppers. Um, he was a friend of Phoenix's. Was he was there when he died. Right. So was very he? sure. Very close. Because, yeah, so there, it was outside the Viper Room, which Johnny Depp co-owned at the time. And I'm pretty sure that Johnny Depp was on stage with Flea because Johnny Depp plays guitar and, you know, they're friends or whatever. Sure. And they were what on is stage. Their life? When, I know they were on stage when they heard that River Phoenix was out the front overdosing. I think they ran out. I'm sorry. Did somebody inter- like interrupt their performance? That's rude. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello. I'm just trying to do a bass solo here. <laughs> a boom, 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 boom. <laughs> My bass solo is a double bass, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, the Viper Room in my head changed from like a dirty, like spew filled nightclub to like a smoky. A boom, jazz boom, club. Boom, boom, yeah, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Everyone's so, in black and white. Yeah. yeah. So this Dean comes up to me. She says, <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a fedora. So, Fleet, what were you going to say? Fleet was annoyed about it. Uh, yeah, he was apparently quite angry about it. Um, and he, he said he, uh, some people say he either threatened to fight Tism or even kill them over it. So he was pretty upset about it. Apparently, um, before talking to Richard Kingsmill, who's like a long term. Um, music manager at Triple J, mm. still around? Yeah. And He's the, the king. He does, he hosts the Sunday night new music show. He's the uh, group director of music. Right. And he He's the big boss. He um talked about uh interviewing Flea um just before Californication came out, their biggest album. Yeah. And he said just before they started talking, Flea brought up Flea brought up <laughs> just did a real <laughs> Tiny tiny sneeze. I'm trying not to interrupt you, but in doing so, interrupted you. I'm so sorry. Uh, so um, apparently, Flea, before the interview started off, Mark, he started talking about how annoyed he was, how furious he was with Tism and this song. And Kingsmill was just like, he just had to be like, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And just quietly thinking, we played it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we got that song a lot of support. Yeah. I'm making that call. Yeah. 
<laughs> I won't tell you that. No. Yeah. But shit. I made that out single of the week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. They, they would have been on super high rotation, I imagine. Um, later, speaking to the age and uh, big newspaper in Melbourne, Ron Hitler Barassi said about about the song, he said that the line, I'm on the drug that killed River Phoenix, wasn't about River Phoenix at all. That song was about fame. It was sort of making fun of how everything's overblown with fame, right? And then when the journalist asked him if he'd ever had a chance to explain this to Flea, Barassi replied, I had him on the ground and I was just about to break his nose with my forehead <laughs> and I said... You do know, Flea, that satire. <laughs> <laughs> you do know, Flea, that satire is a legitimate art form stretching back to ancient Greek drama. And he said, "Oh, that's okay then, Ron. <laughs> He's a good guy, Flea. He's a mate of ours." <laughs> Fucking hell, they are the best. There's such little shits, and it's just—it's awesome. It would be so fun to just—you like, there's no pressure on you, yeah. to say to you could just say anything, and it's all just sort of having a good time. Um, but they are just do seem like if you listen to interviews, they do sound so quick. They're very intelligent. Yeah. Um, but I mean, some of that is probably their talk. Their I think they all met at Melbourne Uni. Yeah, I, I've said that mentioned a couple of times. So like highly educated, but suburban kids. Mm. They grew up in Springvale and and sort of work, real working class areas. So that I think that's a big part of who they are as a band. They're the mix of the suburbs and the sort of you know the. Yeah. Tertiary education, ed- educated elite type, and that yeah, it's a it's a real funny dichotomy. Mm. <laughs> I I got to interview Humphrey B. for Bear. Uh, Jess was in the room at the time for I community was. TV, and I I asked him. I'm like going. Was he in a costume? No, no. This is okay. after. So I will talk about this later. He's he's um his name's Damien Cow, and he's um oh I do know Damien Cow. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. he, he's. Uh, op- I've been open about his identity since, whereas none of the others really have. Um, I wonder how, if, do the others mind that he's? I think he must have had that discussion. Sure. He, he wrestled with it a lot, I believe, but yeah. um, I'm sure he he would have talked it through. I mean, who cares? It's it's his life. Yeah. All right, I'm finally prepared to admit it. I am the original Jock Cheese. <laughs> oh my god! What? <sighs> finally got off my chest. <laughs> you started in the band. Before you were born. No, this it's been an elaborate lie. I'm not twenty eight. I'm forty eight. Whoa. You still you look great. Thank you so but much. But also awful. Thank you. <laughs> Somehow both. Jock cheese. Ah. Ah. <laughs> that makes sense. But I, I remember asking uh Damien Cow on, on that show. I said something like, I'm I'm gone. I said to him before and I'm like, feel free to give me as much shit as yeah. you want. But he's just such a super nice guy. And then, but I'm trying to sound smart, and I said something like, "I'll I'll post this interview somewhere." But I said something like, um, "Yeah, so it's like um, <laughs> you sort of, you know, your your highbrow references and your lowbrow stuff. It's kind of like a it's sort of like a cool, interesting juxtaposition, <laughs> isn't?" It? And he said something like, um, "Matt, I couldn't make that question any better by answering it." <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! That yeah, was so efficient. It was so efficient. The uh, taking down of me. Yeah, he roasted you real that good. That is great. He was very nice. He was so nice. What a legend. Um, <laughs> so what was I talking about again? Oh, so the success of this album, Machiavelli, uh, was big, and it it opened the band up to new audiences. They played on the massive Big Day Out tour, which is is the huge at the peak was a huge tour around Australia. Went to all the capital cities in front of you know thirty thousand ish mm. fans, maybe. I have no idea, but something like that. Um, and looking back at this period of mainstream success, uh, Ron joked to the Adelaide Advertiser that the only reason Tism spent years and years and years in the artistic, pure avant-garde is because the mainstream wouldn't have us. But now the mainstream has embraced us. The avant-garde can go stuff themselves as far as we're concerned. <laughs> For years and years we've been slagging off the mainstream media and talking about corporate rock and roll and the mendacious and tropic forces of world capitalism. But that's only because they wouldn't give us any money. The only reason we wouldn't sell our principles was because no one was buying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming out of their biggest mainstream success, Tism went back into the studio to record their follow-up album, www.tism.wanker.com, which released in 1998, which I think with a name like that, you could probably <laughs> guess that. The album was highly anticipated, but their choice of single uh, titled I Might Be a but I'm not a fucking 
with its accompanying video that parodied a celebrity sex tape, meant that neither radio nor television would touch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're on a hot streak. Yeah. It felt like, yeah, this is the time. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if they released What Are Ya, because that's off the same album as the first single. And would, would that have um, sort of made this album sort of similar heights? But uh, the album did s- sell well, but not anywhere near as well <laughs> as the previous album. Um, it is a, I think it's another another really good album, obviously. And is that, is it, do you reckon that website still exists? I don't think it does. Disappointing. I don't think that, yeah, their website's not up anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, it'd be cool if it did, but yeah, that would, you know, that's, that would be them making things easy. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, good point. They uh, won't do that. Yeah, I, I think I asked a similar question to Damien on that interview. I'm like, was that on purpose? Were you trying to, were you like, We've had so much success, let's make it hard for us to have success now. And he he basically said, really, it was just bravado and we didn't know. You know, we didn't know any better. We yeah. just thought, whatever. We'll find that interview anyway. I'm very much paraphrasing him there. And he was like, um, yeah. Um, uh, ooh, uh, I'm um. Damien <laughs> and uh, Matt's the smartest man I've ever met, that's for oh, sure. I have to go, I have diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but I definitely remember he had diarrhea. Yeah, he had the shit. <laughs> uh, after the. T- <laughs> you hated that because you hate poo jokes, but that's very funny. I reckon Damien would have loved it. Oh, he'd love it. After the tour in support of uh, Wanker.com, Tism moved from Shock Records to Festival Mushroom Records. Uh, which re-released much of their back catalogue again on CD. <laughs> That's funny they keep doing that. As well as a double album of new material uh, called De Rigor Mortis, um, <laughs> which had a, a second disc, which was a a uh, like a rock opera called Two Pot Screamer, um, and that was released in <laughs> 2001. It debuted at number, and I remember because I bought, that was the first album I bought at the time. That was my, you know, the first album that came out when I was properly aware of them and stuff. Mm. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that even on that the bonus album, there's a lot of bleeps. Like they didn't get they often happen where things have to get bleeped because of legal advice after they've produced it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's like a song and you just hear beep. <laughs> yeah. Names have been bleeped out. It's happened a few times. They're redacting music. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so great. Um it debuted at number twenty four on the charts and apparently uh, Flaubert talked to Triple J and predicted it would drop. He said something like it would drop out of the charts like a stone the following week, and he was right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess all their, they're a band with a dedicated fan base. They're one of those bands that buy. They all buy it straight away. Yeah. I remember their final album, the um, White Album. I went to JB Hi-Fi. I've probably said this before. I went week after week. Oh, I've heard you say that. It was that. due yeah. to be released, and it was delayed for whatever reasons, and I kept going, as the new Tillamook on it. Oh, bless. I'm imagining you going in your school uniform. Uh, no, I think that would have been would have been just after school. But I mean, you were wearing Yeah, I was still wearing uniform. the school uniform, yeah. Mm, these little shorts <laughs> and his knee-high socks. And the, oh, so cute. He just wants his new sir, album. Excuse me, sir. Can I have some more Tism albums? <laughs> I'm afraid not today. No, not today, son. I should say the Australia, the lucky country without the re. Um, mm. Australia, the lucky. Um, I, I years ago was in a bidding war on eBay for it. I got up to when I was, you know, it would have been early twenties, and I had a lot of money, and I bid up to two hundred bucks, and I didn't get this, like this five track EP. It was going for up over two hundred bucks wow. for a CD. Wow. Was the was the original artwork, and, and so you couldn't get your hands on it. Couldn't get my else. hands on for that much. I, I I I was like, oh, you know, when your heart's beating real fast, yeah. like, oh, this is higher than I can afford. <laughs> I'm gonna go one more. All right, one more. I Ooh. hope I hope, yeah. I, you hope I don't get it. This yeah. is too much. Uh, yeah. So I I really D Rigor Mortis. I smashed that that album. I, I love a lot, but it isn't it isn't necessarily loved by um critics. Mm. I think it's a bit underrated. But um, in 2003. We're moving towards the end of their career now. In 2003, the band filmed a one-off concert special called the Save Autism Telethon. Um, the stage was set up complete with a panel of actors playing volunteers, making pretend pledges throughout, or taking pretend pledges throughout the show. And, and there was an MC in a tuxedo <laughs> calling himself Marcel Proust. <laughs> but I think it was actually played by um, Melbourne writer Marco Tool. I was there that night. Oh, um, so you could go along. 
Yeah, so it was, it was at the Hi-Fi bar, then the Hi-Fi, but now I'm known as Max Walsh. All right, so it actually wasn't broadcast then? It wasn't broadcast, no, so this is all oh, live so, yeah, in the yeah, room. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, awesome. it was it was filmed and um, uh, later released on DVD. But uh, this wasn't the first high-concept live concert they put on. In fact, most of their shows had some elements of this, and I found a bunch of them listed on, on that ABC uh, J-Files article. Mm. Uh, as a standard, their live shows always were highly choreographed. Each song had its own dance, <laughs> and all the members would dance in unison. I do. I'm pretty sure your family friend, though, when he joined, he said, "I'll play guitar. I'll wear the costumes, <laughs> but I ain't dancing." <laughs> Does that sound like him? Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which uh, is pretty funny. Um, so you'd always see him stand. He's sort of planted on the <laughs> left side of the stage, just or right, or, you know, on the edge of the stage. Um, Stage so, left. Stage left. So they <laughs> they all had well rehearsed, uh, routine, well rehearsed routines, and the band didn't talk between songs. They would just hold out um, big hand drawn cards with the names of their following song, kind of like a you know like a wrestling bout where yeah. they'd say round <laughs> one or whatever on it, and then they'd fling them out in the crowd. So you'd often see people walking home from gigs with oh, a few of these um, title cards under their arms. Sick. Um, so that's all just normal stuff. But here's a list of some of the more involved live show concept as listed on that ABC article. The Tism Opera. Uh, upon arriving at the Palace Theatre of the Palace in St Kilda, unsuspecting entrants were given cryptic brochures pertaining to tonight's opera performance. Behind, behind the stage were rows and rows of empty seats like bleachers. As the start of Tism set became uh, came closer, these were gradually filled by people wearing formal wear and toting opera glasses. <laughs> <laughs> this is about behind them on the stage. When Tism started playing, these upper crust toss, toffs peered down at the band and crowd as they were the strangest curiosities um, presented for their titillation and amusement. <laughs> In between songs, they'd offer a light patter of applause as they looked down their noses at the scene before them. It was disconcerting enough through the show, but in the encore, the wall between the artificial class divide crumbled and many of the opera set stage dived into the crowd, or obviously the actors or whatever, only to be pummeled for their earlier condensation by the Tism fans. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, another time they did a show it was like a stock exchange when they uh, launched their single Let's Form a Company. Um, uh, at this launch, the entire palace stage was transformed into a huge stock exchange with all of the listed stock options being different Tism songs. Uh, there were buyers on the floor bidding and fake chalkies running around above them on platforms making mark of stock movements and fluctuations. The joke was that every time Tism started a new song, that track's share values would plummet as everyone clamoured to sell. Wow. Uh, they played at the Virgin Megastore opening. Um, <laughs> so when when uh, Virgin deigned to open one of their new megastores in Melbourne uh, in 1989, they cordoned off nearby Russell Street and held a big open-air concert to celebrate. Tism were one of the main acts. Uh, when it was their turn to play, the curtains drew back to reveal a massive backdrop advertising the long-standing independent music store Gaslight Records. <laughs> Members of the band threw thousands of gaslight flies into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the set, Hitler Barassi launched into a spoken word attack on Virgin and all that it stood for. A uh, lengthy, abusive rhyme along the lines of Richard Branson has taken my family for ransom. <laughs> He, that was something that Ron Hitler Barassi would do every show. He'd do a, a long sort of ranty diatribe poem. Um, the other members of the band were furiously moving gear into a truck as he's ranting uh, <laughs> that had backed up onto the stage. And as he finished his stinging diatribe, he joined them in the back of the truck, which promptly rolled its do doors down and drove away. That That's, is so wild. It's so cool. <laughs> and why would Virgin book it's like an a act weird like that? Book, yeah, because like they someone hadn't done their homework on that. I know all the kids. Oh, these guys got so, four songs in the top. You know, two songs in the top ten. The Triple yeah. J kids love these guys. We'll get them in. Oh no, oh, that's, that is wild. Uh, and another another show they uh, they um, they talk about a, a lot in the band about how the fans at shows, there's two kinds of Tism fans, the sort of big meatheads at the front who, like, get real physical and then the sort of the nerdy guys at the back, which is, I guess is all a part of the same um, dichotomy between their yeah, um, lyrical high, content. High and lower. Um, so uh, it says, playing uh, upon the oft-lampoon de delineation of Tism crowds between those up the front and those up the back, one of Hitler Barassi's incredible shouty diatribes was titled 
well, I'm one of the guys who stands up the front to see Tism, which is, it was just sort of, it was being very mocking to the people who stand up the front. Uh, and it had the immortal conclusion. And if you think that's bad, then you should see the who stand at the back. This show at the palace featured a secret second stage at the rear of the venue and two full Tism setups. When the curtain opened to start the show, the band was suddenly playing at the back of the venue. That there was a free for all as people scurried to take up their traditional vantage points either at the oh front or the God. back, only for the band to suddenly appear back on the main stage after a couple of songs, and then they would just repeat that, <laughs> switching back to front, back to front, and then finally back to the Save Autism Telethon. Um, the 2003 show at Melbourne's Hi-Fi Bar opened with a host of uh, a panel of phone operators trying to solicit donations and an attempt to raise one million dollars to stop Tism from breaking up. <laughs> Uh, after each song, they'd take a few callers, like pre-recorded calls, kind of like audio sketches um, as the band s- stood still in the breaks. This is all available. You can see all this online as well. The payments climbed closer and closer as the night um, went on. And just before the set concluded, they announced, unfortunately, they'd missed the target by $1. <laughs> <laughs> this meant, as you maybe would predict, the crowd started piffing dollar coins <laughs> at the stage and Australian dollar coins are They're he- heavy. heavy, chunky little coins. And you can see one of them hits um, Marcel Proust, the MC, in the glasses. Oh, my God. <laughs> Holy crap. It's, yeah, so it's it's pretty wild and, yeah, that would hurt anyway. Yeah. Uh, but they obviously they stuck to the script and like, That's sorry. That's so funny. Um, the show was released the next year on DVD as part of their final album, the White Album package, sort of a play on... <laughs> The Beatles' White Album. Um, Album. And it came with two DVDs, uh, including a documentary uh, and the live show on a second DVD. Um, So it it became their last LP. And due to its unorthodox package of having the DVDs along with it, it was ineligible for the ARIA charts, unfortunately. So I'm not sure how successful it was sales-wise. It's interesting. It it came in a DVD case. I guess it just counted. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. but Yeah, that's odd. Would have been interesting to see if it, it charted or whatever. Yeah. Certainly if there were many other nerds like me <laughs> rocking up to JB Hi-Fi every couple of days. So cute. Um, um hello. I was just wondering if the latest season come in. <laughs> That's the mean, what a pain. Like, what are you talking about? Go away. These but... little shorts in day high socks. Every week did you have to get the courage up to ask again? Be like, oh. Yes. Um, oh. sorry to bother you. I was just wondering if the new tism was there. As you can see, the old tism. <laughs> Is there a new tism yet? <laughs> I'm so sorry, not not yet. You're like, please, you could just call us. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering why. What's going on? Oh, me again? <laughs> Catch, catching a bus down there or something? Uh, um, that's my impression of you, and I think it's all right. That's not bad. That was me. That was me back then. That's not bad. <laughs> uh, uh, did you uh, cry when they finally said, "Oh, actually, yeah, that arrived this it morning"? It was a beautiful moment. Uh, it was a really nice moment. I ended up. I met. I met um, Ron and Humphrey at a, a, sh- a showing. There was a, at Acme that they, they showed the live footage um, when they released it. And of the high five bar geek that you'd yeah, been at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then and there was some Q&A and stuff like and that. And you already owned the DVD. I already owned the DVD because <laughs> I, I bought it the day it came out. And then I got, um, after the show, you can line up, meet and greet, which oh I never, I would never know. I don't think it's the only time maybe I've ever done it. Yeah. And I got to the front. I realized everyone's buying the album there and getting it signed. I'm like, oh, I've already got it at home. So I didn't have it there to get it signed. Oh. And I regret it after that I didn't just buy another fucking copy. But I, I pulled out of my pocket the only thing I had. And for, for because of the songs with Saints lyrics in the past, I assume they were Saints supporters for some reason. And I'd just been to the footy to see the Tigers play the Saints. The Saints had a great win. <laughs> And Best I, day what ever. What a day for you. And I remember that because I, I I go, would you mind, I don't have, I've already got the album at home, but would you mind signing this? And Humphrey was like, all right. He turns out doesn't give a fuck about football Good. at all. But Ron does. And he goes, oh, what a shit game. It turns out he was a Tiger supporter. Oh. I'm like, oh, I thought you were a Saints supporter. Sorry about that. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, I guess they're sort of the unofficial team of the so I bet he was shattered. He's obviously a big footy fan. Wow. Anyway, wait, what wait a, for you to pour salt on that wound. What a tedious story. Anyway, they, <laughs> no, it's I mean, cute. they're one no, of but, the most successful um, teams I was ever. just wondering if you could <laughs> sign this for me. I don't have the album here with me. I, I, I swear I own it already. I bought it. I went to JB Hi-Fi every day. <laughs> 
And I, it would have been, I'm sure I would have got home. I, I would have I been leaving. That. I would have been thinking in my head like, you idiot, idiot. Yeah. Why don't you say all these different things? Oh, yeah. Lying in bed that night going, stupid, stupid. You should have bought the album. Yeah. Should have shut your mouth and just let them talk. God, idiot. I did that so often with Tripod. Yeah. Don't, I firstly couldn't talk to them. It took me five, six years to talk to them. The with, musical comedy trio Tripod. Yeah, the reason I do comedy Tripod and uh, and then even then, every time, any time I did, I'd, I'd walk away like, "What the fuck did you just say, you idiot? They hate you. You are a stupid moron. Never go into comedy. You might meet them at some point." I, I remember one time I, on the same night, I had two awkward moments at Melbourne Comedy Festival when I was in a teen. Some try I, Yon walked past, uh, and I went, "Hey." And he looked as like, yeah, and I just pretended I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was panicked. <laughs> panicked. I panicked. And another time I was lining up to see Greg Fleet and he was walking past the line going in. I'm like, oh, hey, oh, look for the show. Uh, oh, such a big fan. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I shouldn't have said it. Oh, so sorry. And he's just having to calm me down. <laughs> he's going, hey, no, it's great. Hey, it's really nice. Oh, no. Thanks so much for coming. It's really nice to meet you. I'm like, oh. Shit, I'm such an idiot. Shouldn't have said. I'm so sorry. Just, you've you've got a you've got a show to think about. What am I talking to you for? Oh, I'm so sorry, Greg Fleet. You're a legend of comedy, and I'm an idiot. I'm this so is sorry. The best. And he's just sort of like pat me. And yeah. then he was around at our studio years <laughs> later, and I retold him the story. Obviously, he had no memory of that. And he's just like, oh yeah, sorry, man. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, so, yeah, I'm no, sorry. No. And then again, I'm like, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that night, <laughs> you idiot! Stupid, stupid, stupid! I want to bring that up. I had a chance to play it cool. Uh. So in five years again, so uh, t- five years ago, uh, you were at the Stupid Old Studios, and I was telling you the story. <laughs> oh no! I did oh. it again. Uh, I did. I, the next time I spoke to him properly, we were driving up to a gig. I was supporting him up in <laughs> Albury. Oh my god! So I was sharing a car up there, and I did not mention anything. Played it like I'd never heard of him before. Very good. Hey, who, who are you again? Greg yeah. who? Greg who? <laughs> nice. Greg Feet, was it? <laughs> yeah. Who's supporting who are you? Am yeah. I on? Am, Am I, I the star on? here? Yeah. Or... So here, let me give you a few tips for comedy because I know you're new. <laughs> well, like I was obviously didn't go that far, but it definitely was a much <laughs> yeah. nicer experience. Good, Matt. Well Just done. Just talking to people like people. You learnt. Also, like I, I think I've realised by now that people are people. Yeah. Well, people sometimes get excited to meet us, and it, and I stand there going, "I'm a, per- I put my pants on one leg at a time." Yeah, I'm well, a regular you know, human being. I think I, I can, I can, um, I can definitely see how stupid they are. <laughs> so dumb, because I'm an idiot. You are. I'm a nothing I'm, person. I'm rarely excited to see you. Wow. Rarely, but often it happens. Dave, I'm always excited to see you. Yeah, that's, you two balance me out. <laughs> I was joking. I am very excited. Fuck I was you. trying to play Fuck cool. you. I was trying to play Fuck cool. you, dumb <laughs> I've learned my lesson now. Anyway, what were we talking about? Tism. You better beep that we're out. My time. parents will be listening. Which bit? Where I said, you dumb Okay. Oh, there's a lot of bleeps. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, we were talking about the time that you met Tism and fucked <laughs> Uh, I just want to move on. Yeah. Oh, you You're more... literally in control of the report. You can move on. If he you went, want tell to. me, did tell me those Matt, magic do words. Go on. Oh, he went for Richmond, and you showed him the thing that made his team lose. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's one of my one of my favorite albums. The, their final album, the White Album. Yeah. <laughs> and what what year was the final one? Two thousand and four, two thousand three, two thousand four. Well, I know fifteen. That's well, a 15 long Two thousand four, I think. Yeah. Um. The album had a a, a few um, live favourites, even though it was only a tour, maybe two tours after the album came out. Uh, one of them was played, I reckon, at all gigs was uh, Tism a Shit, which is <laughs> a song about how they're shit, which is you still see on, if you look at any thread online about Tism, someone will be on there saying Tism a Shit, yeah. which would be confusing to people coming in. Going, yeah. Why do they, geez, they attract a lot of hate? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a big fan. I love them. <laughs> the album's opening track, everybody, el- oh, sorry, everyone else has had more sex than me. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> and I was thinking, <laughs> wow. Is that that song? Uh, Afterwards, yes. everyone else has had more sex than me. Whoa. <laughs> 
I was released with an animated film clip uh, with little bunnies in a, in a, in a running race. And they gained uh, a lot of traction online, especially in Germany, so much so that it was released there as a single by Sony BMG. Um, and it was Tism's only non-Australian release. Wow. And made the commercial charts in Germany. Holy shit. Kind of, kind of a, quite a weird end to their long recording yeah. career as a band. Um, then the the Green Room with Paul Provenza, which is a, a comedy chat show, used another track off that album, Somebody Start a Fight or something, as their <laughs> uh, the show's theme song. Cool. Um, th- their final concert was at the Earthcore Festival on the 27th of October 2004, which is kind of like a bush doof festival. Right. This is like a seemingly odd place for them to perform at all, let alone their big final gig. Mm. So I'm not exactly sure the story of why that was or if that was... Just them going, yeah, this would be a nice weird way to end. Mm. Or or if, yeah, I'm just not sure. Um, but, yeah, it sort of feels almost fitting that um, I've still got the the Beat magazine, the street press that uh, the front cover that week came out with a drawing of Tism hiding in the trees taking over Earthcore, which is pretty sick. That's cool. Yeah, it's pretty sick. Yeah, um, it's pretty sick. <laughs> yeah. Um, excuse me, I was just wondering <laughs> if you had any more copies of Beat magazine. Broden was on the same episode that uh, we yes. when we interviewed Damien Cow, <laughs> playing my cousin, yeah. an air conditioning salesman. But he was he was giving me like he's like oh, I'm loving seeing your fanboy. Yeah, <laughs> and the ad breaks. Oh, fanboying. I'm like I'm playing cool, man. I'm playing pretty. Is cool. that your Broden impression? Oh, my Broden. Holy Matt, it's been born. Well, Matt, it's Matt. very nice to see you, a fanboy. You're a fanboy. 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 Yeah, he's a hard. That was hard the one. first time I'd properly met Broden. Yeah, right. Because before that, we'd interacted on Twitter, and then one time I walked past him at Town Hall during Comedy Festival, and he he kind of waved at me, and I freaked out because I was like, "Oh my god, Broden knows who I am." So this is the first time that we'd properly <laughs> that we had properly met. You guys was, are such losers. Fuck you. Um, but he was in character the whole time. So he was like a bit gruff, yeah. kind of because he was in this character. And then as soon as we finished taping, he was like, so great to properly meet you, Jess. It's so exciting. And I was like, oh, my God, you're actual Broden. <laughs> it was very confusing. Yeah. He really he went deep into the rhino character. Yeah. <laughs> rhino, the air conditioner salesman. <laughs> <laughs> rhino. <laughs> oh, so good. This is uh, what you would know about well, Jess. I was just going to mention uh, about your family friend, how he, he sadly passed away in 2008 after battling cancer mm-hmm. at the age of 50. Jock to his friends, um, real name James Paul. His obituary in The Age was a really nicely written article about him, which is sort of like an insight to stuff that you may not have heard otherwise. Yeah. Because it was all very private stuff, I guess. But here's part of it. it said, Paul joined Tism in 1992. Ten years after the group was formed by Melbourne University friends. That was where I read Melbourne Uni. met at Melbourne Uni, yeah. And his fine guitar playing and songwriting became an integral part of the group's groundbreaking music and outlandish performance art concepts. He was part of Tism's most successful period, which took them to what once would have been an unthinkable ascent into the top ten in album charts. His talents were not confined to the punked up pop of Tism. His mastery of the classical guitar meant he could add haunting folkish accompaniment to the music of other singers such as Astrid Munday. He also enjoyed a quietly satisfying career playing Chicago blues as the front man of his own band Blind Lemon Chicken. And even within Tism, he pushed the boundaries, scoring and conducting a fully realised madrigal piece that was unceremoniously tacked onto the end of an album, unlisted and unlauded. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's funny that you you, um, you were talking earlier about we couldn't remember what his name was. Mum couldn't remember. And when he did pass away, I was in year 12 and I was reading something like Beat magazine, but it might have been Beat actually, and it just had this tiny little thing about a member of Tism had passed away. And they called him Jock Cheese and now I remember Mum being like, no, he wasn't Jock right. Cheese. Yeah, that, I think it because his, his nickname off stage was, was Jock. That led to a lot of confusion at the time. Yeah. So... So it was, yeah, false you report a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's obviously, that's a bit heartbreaking. I think that probably, cause people always talk about will they get back together and I'm, I don't, I don't have no idea, but I always thought, mm. oh, that's probably makes it very difficult. Yeah. You, they, oh, I, I wouldn't speak on their behalf. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, who knows? But yeah, he can't. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. They, um, but yeah, I've also, again, on that interview with, Damon Cowell, he, I asked him that question, would they ever? Mm. And he's sort of like, he's like, 
to be honest, it would probably be shit if we did. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't just, played for a while now. Self-deprecating to the end. He just was like, yeah. He's just like, you know, everyone thinks it's a good idea for bands to come back. Yeah. But it usually isn't. Yeah. That's kind of what he said. Yeah. And, and I'll talk basically to finish off, talk about Humphrey B. Flaubert, a.k.a. Damien Cow. Mm. Most of the other members of, of Laid Loads since. Um, but Humphrey came out... Uh, in 2007, okay. started playing shows again under the name DC Root, fronting a band called Root, all caps with an exclamation mark. <laughs> Sorry, I should say Root were like a country-ish kind of band. Mm-hmm. And he's still sort of hiding his identity a little bit. But the DC and DC Root's obviously his initials. Uh, then after Root um, finished up, he was commissioned by David Walsh, the boss at Mona, to create a soundtrack for his... Uh, museum, the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart, and the soundtrack was titled Versus Art. In 2010, cool. after Root broke up, the DC3 was formed, a three-piece, fronted by him again, and now who was sort of out as Damien Cow, the first time I think he really talked about his real name, and the band released a single called I Was the Guy in Tism, <laughs> <laughs> which ended any speculation as to his identity. Just <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> yeah. Because obviously he had, he's got a very distinctive voice. He's the uh, more melodic singer. Ron Hitler Barassi is the more of the ranty, rockier singer. And Damien Cowell's got that great big soaring. Right. So not the one that's like, forget Stoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, <laughs> that's Ron. Um, forget Old Ice Tea. <laughs> but, whereas uh, uh, Damien Cowell was, bought a car just the <laughs> yeah, other day. Yeah, right. Man, could that baby run? <laughs> If you haven't heard them, you've got to check them out. They're so great. Yeah, I might. I should make it. I wish they were on Spotify so I could make a playlist for people to listen to. But I'll I'll put some links so people can find it. Um, yeah. Uh, so he was he was now making art basically for like probably Australia's maybe most famous modern museum. Yeah. Uh, in 2000, so then DC3 also disbanded. And in 2015, he started touring his solo project, which is called Damien Cow's Disco Machine. <laughs> Uh, so far, they've released two albums, and he's collaborated. Each album is like every track seems to have a different big name from Australian music or comedy, including Sean McAuliffe, Tim Rogers, Kate Miller Heidke, John Safran, Sam Pang, Julia Zamiro, and Tony Martin. Yeah, Tony, doesn't Tony Martin perform with him now? Shit. Tony Martin has sort of become an honorary full time member of the group now. Yeah, so it's, it, and I've seen him play a few times. So much fun. I mean, all these shows are so much yeah. great fun. He started even doing a, a little um, Tism medley. Mel- medley, yes, and um, which is kind of nice. And I think it really there are it's it, it's definitely in the same ballpark of Tism. Very funny, clever lyrics over just catchy, bouncy party tunes. I mean, it's yeah, he sort of really embraced the the disco idea. Awesome. Um, so yeah, uh. Tony Martin's now become a full-time member of the group. Um, <laughs> What's a, Tony play or do? He's sort of like dancing backup vocals. <laughs> Tony Martin dancing. Yeah, his dance is real fun. He's, he just he goes all in. I love yeah, it. Yeah, great. Funnily enough, the first time Tony Martin met Damien Cowell, he had no idea who he was uh, behind the balaclava. This is from an article on Sydney Morning Herald's website, a big paper in Sydney, obviously. Martin was on air with Mick Malloy at Fox FM. It was the, the big radio show at the time, Martin Malloy, uh, in Melbourne when two members of techno rock satire troupe Tism arrived in full regalia for their scheduled interview. The radio comedians couldn't have known that the masked man identifying as Humphrey B. Flaubert was in fact a mild-mannered advertising copywriter from sister <laughs> station Triple M <laughs> taking a sneaky break from his office cubicle downstairs. Damien had called a cab, left his desk and gone down to the back alley to meet up with Ron Hitler Barassi and get into these giant inflatable Archbishop costumes. This is, this is all quoting Martin. They got in the cab and drove around to the front of the building, came up and did the interview, then went back downstairs again, got changed and went back to his desk. It was a full <laughs> 10 years before I knew that, Martin says. That's awesome. That's so funny. It's in the same building. Yeah. That's so good. I love committing to it, to yeah. get, like, calling a cab. So say you're rocking up in a cab and <laughs> I'm just walking. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys, got to go to the dentist. Be back in an hour. Yeah. Just going to go be on radio for a bit. So fun. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I, I really like I like that story a lot. They really do, like, not only in their music, but it does seem like with everything, they don't take anything too seriously. Yeah. It's all very serious, but also not serious at all. I mean, this is serious, Mum. Exactly. Yeah. Far out. 
That's what a good. juxtaposition, yeah. am I right? <laughs> <laughs> what a dichotomy. It's a word you've thrown around a yeah. few times and I love it. Big fan of that word. Yeah, so you should be. This is, Just to finish, maybe uh, this is the final paragraph of that ABC article, which mm. I think sums it all pretty nicely. Uh, even though I don't know if it's fully true, because the first one says there will never be another band like Tism, whereas I do think Damien Cowell's Disco Machine is a bit, a band quite like a Tism. bit like Tism. But all the same, there will never be an. And it, also interestingly, I had uh, Tony Martin on Primates, a uh, spinoff show from this, uh, and we talked a bit about uh, Damien Cowell's Disco Machine and stuff. And he pointed out, which is um, I, I knew, but it didn't really sink in that he since uh, Tism finished, Damien Cowell's probably I think he's done more LPs. Outside of Tism than he did with Tism, maybe wow. now. So he's been, he's been pretty prolific since leaving, while still always keeping up the day job. I think there's other bits and pieces off the side, like um, uh, Jock Cheese released a solo album called Platter. Jock Cheese Platter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ron Hitler Barassi released a, a a novel, which is um, as him as his own, you know. Right, um, his actual name. Yeah, uh, he we, didn't want to put Ron Hitler Barassi <laughs> on a book. No, nah, yeah, weird like that. Huh. I think the first time the names were revealed um, that people noticed was, do you, do you remember John Safran's Music Jamboree? Yeah, basically, yeah. Was, yeah. I, I, I Great really, show. really liked yeah. it, yeah. Are they on, on that they played Never Gonna Be an Old Man River with on Greek instruments. They did yeah, that's like right, a world have music all, segment. At the end they'd always have, I remember, Friends of Rome. Played Punch, uh, in, the punch in the Face. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, and then in the credits they listed their real names oh. performing the song. So that... Um, let the cat out of the bag for some people. Ah. I think these days it would be very hard to keep such things a secret anyway. Yeah. But it's also like how much do people care about it or not. Um, but, yeah, he, he released a, a, a fiction novel a few years back. What else are other interesting tidbits? There's so many. And I, yeah. this is what I was saying. Like I could have – there's so many funny interviews I would have loved to have read out and gone through different songs and stuff. But I think this is probably the way to go for a sort of a like an – I imagine a lot of the listeners had never heard of Tism, yeah. apart from me banging on about it on this show. Anyway, uh, to finish, this is it from the ABC. There will never be another band like Tism because there will never be another configuration of musically talented and super intelligent people who so gloriously don't give a fuck. <laughs> They're gone, but if there's even a skerrick of justice in this world, they will never be forgotten. For the briefest time, they illuminated the landscape and made life seem exciting and joyous and full of possibilities. That's more than one should ask or expect from a rock and roll band. Tism are dead. Long live Tism. That's great. What a beautiful piece of writing. Yeah, that's beautiful. Good. And I... what a beautiful report. Great job, Matt. That was great, Matt. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was, I'd said to, yeah, I'd love to have had another week to write it, but I think it is, you know. Oh, you've done great. And I knew embarrassingly little about Tism. Yeah, right. Probably because I wasn't allowed to listen to them. Yeah. Because they're not that kid friendly, to be fair. No. And maybe it was because we knew Jock that it would, like, don't, you don't want to hear Jock say yeah, stuff yeah. like that. We don't want it to damage the way the kids look at this nice, lovely man who's been a long time friend. I had no idea they did that. that. Fun stuff for their live shows. Yeah, Man, that would have been so cool. That's wild. It's there were so, so fun. many other ones as well that they talked about. There was a kind of disastrous one where they, because um, they used to play with the suburban stuff a lot. So one, they had whipper snippers and, and lawn mowers <laughs> running inside an enclosed. Oh, that's a terrible <laughs> so idea. So just fumes are just like you couldn't see, and everyone had to, like they had to open up the place to let everyone out. <laughs> so they were always trying out stuff, and it was really making it a show. So there was so that's why I loved it. The live shows were amazing. I was lucky enough to get into them. Like properly over the last like handful of years, and I yeah. think I saw them five times live, and every show like they'd be five of my favorite ever. Are they, and they live did, performances. You saw them do some cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, I was at the telethon, and, and yeah, most of the shows oh, yeah, were of sort of conceptual. I saw one time I saw them do a secret show at the Tote, which is maybe my favorite of all of them. It was them sort of rehearsing just in plain black balaclava in like a, get up, a just, place that only fits like a couple hundred people. Yeah, yeah. just on a proper rock show, kind of iconic. Melbourne bar and um yeah I I I feel I feel sad that I didn't get to see him more but I feel very lucky that I got to see him at all yeah. and so happy that um Damien has uh, continued performing live and and yeah so he's in my head he's sort of making it still happen and he came on your community still TV still cannot show. believe that that was wild that was so cool so cool and you had me on as well Wild. What a and you thing. met Broden. <laughs> so I met Broden that day. Who else? Like Kappa was on. Kappa was there. 
It was an, an all-star cast. Yeah. Olympic gold medalist Lydia Lasala. Lasala. Lasala, and I said it wrong Lassala. on the show. Lasala. I think it's Lasala. <laughs> So oh, I'm yeah, her. she told me after we stopped recording that I'd been saying it wrong. But she was cool. She was nice. She was cool, but she was ice cold how she told me. It was oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Which was probably just fucking with me. It was great fun. She, she turned... was really fun, actually. Yeah. that's how And how amazing that you listed all those people and the gold medalist came last. Oh, yeah, some gold medalist was also. Yeah, but Kappa was there. <laughs> yeah, can you believe it? And Broden <laughs> and Jess. Yes. I was playing a sensor, but I was the sensor button. I reckon if we if we had time to like obviously that was a thrown together show with yeah. no rehearsal or anything, and it was very loose. Yeah. And my parents watched it and said later, "Yeah, I liked that interview towards the end." <laughs> they were looking Good. brutal about it. Xavier Mike Leaders was on as well. Zave was there. Zave was having it was, a breakdown. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I reckon that'd be a sick that'd be a sick weekly late show. But anyway, you know. Well, if when any, I become a millionaire, when any, that, these week, tism bits of memorabilia. So every week you get Lydia Lassler on, you say her name different every single every week. Time. No, That's I a think, funny running joke. I but. just think if there are any TV big wigs listening, then they should give us a show. Hello, yeah. big wigs. That's all I'm asking. Just one shot at maybe a full season, CBS in America. 24 episodes. We Bump not, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> we are not asking too much. Bump um, Stephen Colbert for me and Humphrey B for Bear. Matt. Fantastic report. Fantastic. Thanks, I was very nervous about it. I do know there will be some first-time listeners who've come just for TISM because the fan base is pretty rabid and they take in everything and they will just be sitting there with a, a red pen. No, nah, I don't think so because I think they'd be, they got the right sort of spirit about it. And you covered a lot of great stuff. It was fascinating. It's funny though like because they had, there is more online to know about them now than there was at the time. Now, other interesting fact, you know Jet, the band? Yes. Their, their uncles in Tism? Yes. Yeah, well, you would, you'd know all those. Really? I didn't, I didn't know that. Because Jock came over to our house one time and walked past my bedroom and I had a Jet poster. And he was like, oh, I know those boys. That's and I was funny. like, what? Because <laughs> I still hadn't quite figured. You know when, like, I think it must be the case for kids who <laughs> whose parents are on TV and it's just kind of, well, it's just mum. Yeah. Like, that was just Jock. I was like, what are you talking about? How do you how could you possibly know someone the jet? That's ah! quite it's just his it's his job. It's what he did. That's his. It's a bloody muso. He knows bloody everybody. Muso. I th- they because of that connection, they were pretty merciless um uh giving jet shit in late interviews. <laughs> which is pretty fun that as well. Fun. Which I wouldn't have got the joke at the time, but for them it would have been extra layers of fun because they're just roasting their friend's nephew. nephew. Yeah. <laughs> Nah, good stuff. Cheers, mate. Well, now it's time for that part of the show where we thank some of our Patreon supporters. That's right. Well, we do the least tism thing ever and sell out, baby. Yeah. And the first part, are we doing it? Are we doing it, Maddie? Fact, quote, or question? What a riff! It's so good. This comes from. Manny Gaza. Manny Gaza. And uh, he's given himself the title Junior Vice President of Nick Mason's Golden Tuxedo Rentals. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I wonder who the Senior Vice President is. <gasps> senior Vice. <laughs> is that spot up for grabs? <gasps> that was Apparently that was something Tism did early in their career. They wrote uh, letters to people like uh, Prime Minister Paul Keating and maybe Eddie Van Halen offering them the position of... Uh, Tambourine player in the band. <laughs> what good fun. Um, so Manny asked the question this week, in fact, quote a question. He's chosen question. He asked the question, what advice would you give to other creatives when having a mental block or when feeling down on starting a new project? Oh, a serious question. <laughs> oh. Do we have to give serious answers? Because that would mean being emotionally vulnerable, something artists cannot do. <laughs> Um, what would you do? My thing I like to do is uh, go to other people and watch their stuff. Yep. Listen, listen to something. What are we saying? Ripping off, plagiarizing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, basically, no, get inspired. <laughs> and sometimes I find it can be inspiring if you uh, find inspiration, but not from something in your field. Like, yes. Because uh, I, I, I'm very easily inspired, which is it's great. great. Trait to have, but also yeah. sometimes terrible because I'm like, oh, oh, maybe I should write a book. Oh no, I should do a film. Oh no, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, you watch something really great, 
and even if it's not something you want to do, you go, oh, God, I want, I want to make something that good. Right. But in my own thing. Like when you go and see a really great live band, mm. back when I wanted to be a musician, I'd be like, yeah, I want to, I want to do that. But now I see that and go, oh, that's really great. I want to be that good, but a comedy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. That's cool. So I find it inspiring to watch something great that other people have done. I think that makes sense to me. Reading, I think, is a cool thing to do. Yep. Or just changing up what you're trying to do. So I've just recently had to um, work on a show, and so I went through a lot of the, a lot of these issues. I ch- I kind of changed my daily routine a fair bit. I started uh, waking up earlier and just trying to get into some sort of a routine. I'd, mm. I'd list out um, things I wanted to get done in that day. Uh, I'd also try and sleep better and i've started i've started reading before bed which has um been something that's worked well but i i think just changing up your routine if it's not working then change it up and do something else and i also find depending on what it is i find um doing something that takes part of your focus away that helps me a lot so if i'm sometimes i find it hard to sit and write Mm. or if i'm if i'm feeling blocked up sitting and trying to write i'll go for a drive or go for a walk or something like that some I don't know what the science is because I'm not a scientist. I should say that hmm. uh, something about my my brain having to focus on driving that it frees up whatever's blocking me from thinking yeah, about other true. stuff that it opens up. I don't know. Anyway, I hate myself for talking sincerely for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably say all of those things. Um, do, yeah, do something adjacent not not quite what your thing is but to the left of it you know like i to I've, the left, to to, the yeah left. i've started playing music again not for anybody but myself just to uh get that part of my brain working again i'm trying to read more um but also sometimes you just sort of have to just do it anyway so if it's writing jokes or if it's painting a picture and you're not happy with anything you're doing just do it anyway because it's the process of flexing that muscle so it's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna unblock anyway. So just sit down, even if it's shit, just do it anyway. Do it's beautiful. it anyway, like Ben Folds once said. Mm. 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 Thank you. <laughs> that was too sincere. Yeah, let's. Uh, sometimes let's, I just uh, think about how. Out. Sometimes I just think about how I'm gonna die. <laughs> right. And I find that inspiring because one, two ways. It's like, well, it doesn't really matter. So two. You may as well give it a try. Give it a crack. Yeah. It may definitely well. can go either way. That one. Yeah. I'm gonna die, so I'm not gonna try. Or, or I'm gonna die, so spiral I'm gonna give it a go. Into existential. No, journey. I think some people it works for, but I just think about like, yeah, no, I'm gonna try really hard because I may as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I hope that is a an a, a appropriate answer for you there, Manny. And thank you for thank you for supporting the show. Thanks so, oh, thank thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Another thing we do as well at the end of every episode is we thank a, f- a handful of Patreon supporters who support us at patreon.com slash dogoonpod. That's right. We'd like to thank them in the order that they pledge. So we haven't quite got to you yet. We promise we will soon. And we do appreciate soon, your, soon, soon, soon. your ongoing support. What yes. are, so what are we going to do support, support, support. with these supporters? Um, well, I think, do you remember last week when we uh, had Naomi on? And we uh, sort of did a word at a time. Oh, yeah. I think that would actually we work very a, well with the Tism song. A pseudonym or a Tism song. Oh, pseudonym. Oh, w- oh no, like we're, not, we're not pseudonym. clever enough. They're not going to be so punny. No, no, we, we start and the pun master Dave finishes them off. <laughs> yeah, so okay. we lob them up and then he finishes Yeah, it with okay, great. That. I think that'll what work. What do you reckon? Look, a I, stage name? Like, I don't really like how the pun king, Matt, is trying to put the pun <laughs> thing back on me. All right, trying pun. to rebrand me as the pun master. I feel like today you proved that you actually you are. You actually are. You're very good at it. You are good at it, Dave. You're a pun king. You are. The... I bow down to you. <laughs> do you want to do? So, do you want to do the stage name or the song then? I could do. I reckon either be good. I reckon the pun master could do whatever you want him yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah, come on. Good. Right. Let's alternate. All right, great. Well, I'd love to thank from South. Yorkshire in the UK, Mr. Lewis Foulstone. Ooh. Wow. Maybe because English people pronounce things weirdly. Could be Lewis Fulston. Fulston. Fulston's nice. Mm. Yeah, Fulston's nice. Foulstone sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Probably his real name. Sorry, Sorry Lewis. Sorry Foulstone, but maybe pronounce it Fulston when you Ful- meet new people. Uh, actually, it's Fulston. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, what's that name that looks like, looks like dickhead or something, but people go, no, it's... Dark heed. 
<laughs> there's, real, there's, there's one with Co- Coburn. Yeah, Cockburn. Cockburn. No, no, it's Coburn. Yeah. No, th- what is that C and K doing in the that middle is there? A sweet rebrand. <laughs> that is hasn't, Cockburn. Hasn't quite worked. Just own it, I reckon. Own it, yeah. Double down on the Cockburn. Yeah, <laughs> always double down on the Cockburn. Um, okay, uh, who wants to start? All right. So we just, I mean, should we just work with their actual first name and then, Dave, you can turn that into something? Could you do that? Do you have that skill? <laughs> no. If I said yeah, Lewis, do. could you turn Lewis into a, some sort of a pun thing? Like, could you mix Lewis with some sort of high art thing? Wiss. Yeah. Is there a famous Lewis? <laughs> yeah, or Wistonia oh, what or about, something. Uh, yeah. What about Lou Whistler's mother? Holy Lou Whistler's shit. mother. I don't know what it means, but I love it. No, Whistler's mother, that famous painting, is famously destroyed by Mr. Bean in the Mr. Bean movie. No. Uh, you don't no, know, I don't know it. Do you know Whistler's mother? Well, I don't know. I, I'm, I now know that the you ski said resort that, Whistler in Canada. Now you've said the one that Mr. Bean destroys. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I didn't know what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> you know the Whist- Mr. Bean thing? Yeah, I know the Mr. Bean thing, but I didn't know oh, that's what yeah. it was called. I reckon that's, that's one of the most famous American yeah. paintings of all I time. I have explained that I know it, but I didn't know the she, name. Yeah, she doesn't seem to be whistling to me. No, she's not whistling at all. <laughs> if anything, I'd call that the sitter. Her mouth is closed. No, it's because the painter, painter is Whistler. No, okay. she's not whistling. It's actually called Arrangement in Grey and Black Number that, One. Okay, that, oh, that, no. that we get. <laughs> Thank no, you. Call by its actual name. Yeah, <laughs> talk to us like chump. To be Thank honest, Lou Whistler's mother is pretty good. That's okay. great. And you well, you will do that five more times. Oh, thank crap. you so much, Lewis. Uh, and I'd also love to thank from Horsham in country Victoria, not too far away from us, Lauren Andrew. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for supporting the show. And uh, to thank you, Dave, Will, (laughs) Chris and you. Lauren and Drew Orsay. Fuck, he is good. The Paris Museum. I assume he's good. The (laughs) Musée d'Orsay, the (laughs) museum in Paris. you are crushing it. Which is actually. Once again, we don't know what you're talking about. We assume. This feels like tism. Which is exactly. I assume this is good. Where you can find uh, Whistler's mother, Musée d'Orsay wow. in Paris. Bang. Nailed it. All right. Yep. That's a hot start. So now I have to make the, the next two combine somehow. <laughs> yeah, and I think you can do it. I'd like to thank from Chicago. Chicago. Chicago, the Windy City. Illinois. Uh, Camille Borofsky. Oh. I, we know Camille. We know Camille. He gave me a Gary T-shirt. He's a lovely, lovely man. He was on my blind dating show Spectacular. He was. And I assume that he's very happy with the comedian that he chose. Yeah. Which may... Who was it that night? I can't remember who it was. Anyway. Are you stalling? It's a good stall. It's going to be some milliners or something like that. What's that, a hat maker? You're actually very helpful to him. You're a good team, you two. Should I step out? (laughs) No, you should step up. Oh. (laughs) All right, I've got it. Borrow. Okay, yeah? Camille, a Parker Bowles. Oh, fucking hell, you are good. (laughs) Well done. That is terrible. No, it's brilliant. That is terrible. Wait, what's the second meaning there, though? Don't we need two things? You've just said an existing Uh, person's name. What about Camille La Parker Bowler Hat? Yeah, okay, now we're we're getting somewhere. Highbrow, Bowler Hat, Lowbrow, (laughs) Camille La Parker Bowler. (laughs) Love that. (laughs) Take that, Camilla. (laughs) That is good. And thank you, Camille. We, we, We love you and we miss you. Um, I'd also like to thank from Mudgy in New South Wales, Kirsty Orr. Thank you, Kirsty, first and foremost, while Dave thinks. Oh, we can see the cogs turning. Thank you for supporting the show. <laughs> or nothing in or Orwell. Ornamental. Oh, Kirsty Orr, Wells that ends well. <laughs> Fuck yes! That's George Orwell and Shakespeare in one. Yep. yep. Two of the big writers yeah, so of the human race. Yeah. Or, Orwell, lowbrow, Shakespeare, highbrow. Do you want me to read <laughs> these ones for you so you can think, or do you think you can read them yourself as well? Yeah, maybe you should read them and I'll try and. Okay. You do the first one, I'll do the second one. Okay. I'd like to thank, or oh, Dave would like to thank. Yeah, please. This is my thanks oh, do, to you. You should do it in Dave's voice. <laughs> I'm sweet as shit. <laughs> yeah, Dave. Yeah, he is. That's all I hear when he talks. A scooby doo 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 doo
<laughs> Apologise for Dave and how he always Sorry mocks about your that. people. He's already thinking. I'd like to thank from Botanic Ridge in Victoria, Chris Megazizi. <laughs> <laughs> well, Megazizi. Don't worry, we've picked the uh, easiest name of all time. <laughs> Meggy. Essie, Maggie Essie, Maggie Easy, something like that. You got the... Chris. That's a tough name. Oh, that, that that's good, Maggie Easy. I was thinking of Maggie Easy Top. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, great, very good. Uh, top. Can you turn top into something? God, you top are... gun. Top hat. You are yes. <laughs> top hat. <laughs> oh, Easy. Camilla top. Parker Bowler hat and Chris <laughs> Maggie Easy Top hat. <laughs> well, that's the same top. Together. Low class? Is that what you're saying? Not low class. What am I saying? Low, low brow. Low brow. Well, I mean, you know, if you call that, I'd probably say the other way around, to be honest. Yeah, we're burning up low brow. Are you going to do our last one to bring us home? I'm bringing us home uh, from Amherst in NH. <laughs> New Hampstead? Is that a state? Hampshire. New Hampshire. NH state. U S A. New Hampshire. Yeah, I know. Oh, you already said that. I said that because I'm smart. I thought you were guessing. but you were, I was kind of guessing, okay. but also From I got it right, so now I'm going to be cocky. Amherst in New Hampshire, it's Zachary Allen Ellis. 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 Zachary Allen Ellis in Wonderland wearing a large top hat. <laughs> He's done it again. Yeah. yeah. Woo. Well done, Dave. Very proud of you. Thank we, you. We, we gave you so little help. Thank you so much. That's all you. Well done. To Thank all you the, so much. I reckon putting those six people together, they would definitely make an act that would rival Tism. I also think that um, Zach should make his new ringtone. Zachary Allen Ellis. <laughs> Zachary <laughs> Allen Ellis. <laughs> Zachary <laughs> Allen Ellis. Though, actually, he should get people that, that he knows well to have that be the ringtone when he calls Yes. Them. So it's like he's, his mum's calling. Isn't it? Yeah. So, oh, He's calling. He's his calling mom. his mum, and she just hears Zachary Allen Ellis. Zachary Allen Ellis, and he's like, and she still goes, "I wonder who that is," because <laughs> mums, you know, yeah. they are bloody kooky. They kooks, and I love them. Love mums. Whistler's mother, love her. I'm a mum lover. I'm a mum lover. <laughs> I'm a mum lover, baby. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to all those people who supported hey, the show. Thank you to all the mums out there. <laughs> yeah, thanks to all the mums. If you're a mum or if you have a mum or if you know someone who's a mum or if you've seen a mum on TV. Or if this is a serious mum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, mums. I think we mums. should wrap it up on that fantastic note. We should. Uh, thanks to all the people that listen to the show and have listened right through to the end to hear me say, if you liked it, why not share it with one of your nearest and dearest? For mums. example, your mum. Yeah. Yeah. Get your mum on board. There's a few mums that have gotten on board. Absolutely. I and mean, sometimes we meet them at the live shows with their child. Yes. Yeah. There's been a couple of bubs. I love when there's a bub there. I always want to ask if I can hold the bub, but then I'm like, don't be weird, Jess. You're a stranger. Don't hold the baby. You definitely shouldn't do that. I know. That's why I don't. <laughs> I don't want to I hold mean, it. Like, can I like touch it? I just don't think. I don't think our insurance covers that. Ah, drop babies. Yeah, you're I right. I think I saw that. With I am elastic. very. I am very clumsy, and yeah. my hands are usually covered in butter. You have to tick a thing on the um the performer's <laughs> insurance form. Yeah. Will you be holding a baby? Hmm. Will you be fire twirling <laughs> near a baby? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you want to get in contact with us or support the show on Patreon, you can go to uh, dogoonpod.com. There's also links to our uh, online merchandise and our Red Bubble store where you can get our faces and our logo and all that kind of stuff printed on T-shirts, jumpers, pants, coat hangers. Probably not that, actually. No. I was thinking of coats. Uh, <laughs> clocks. Yep. Top hats. Cushions. Oh, there's plenty of uh, beautiful stuff. So get on it. Uh, yes. Go to that and, uh, yeah, suggest a topic. There's a little link there. And uh, you can suggest a topic. You don't have to be a Patreon supporter to do that. Anyone can suggest a topic at any time. And, of course, the social media. We're at Do Go Unpod and all this stuff. Find us. Click yes. us. Link us. Love us. And, yeah, please do recommend us to a friend. Give us a five-star review if you got the time. That would be so nice. So lovely. Um, we'd really appreciate it. Apparently it lifts visibility, Dave told me a while ago, and I've been banging on about it ever since. Huh. 
He's very impressionable. <laughs> <laughs> I really am. Oh, you got to be mentioning those reviews. That's <laughs> all you're talking about now. Even the people that aren't in the podcast. Hey, uh, do you mind giving us, singing us a five-star review? Can you review? just chuck on uh, a five-star review? It just Thank really you. helps with visibility. Yeah. <laughs> and other, I don't know what it means. Other but... buzzwords. <laughs> yeah. uh, engagement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of a dichotomy there. <laughs> a dichotomy between the audience and the engagement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks so much, everyone, for listening. It has been a real pleasure. I think maybe the next time you hear from us might be in Adelaide. <gasps> That's probably true. If you're in Adelaide. La Dida. It's very exciting. Uh, having a little vino. Woo! Come along to the National Wine Centre on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. We'll be there, regale you with a story as old as time itself. Wow. Is it about clocks? Yeah. Cool. Aladdin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tales as old as time. Wait, is that Aladdin or is that Beauty, Beauty and the, the Beast? Beast? It's the very next line. Uh, it's not going to be talking about Aladdin. Really? I am a singing teapot. <laughs> <laughs> My son is somehow a teacup. <laughs> Although surely she would have a smaller teapot. Yeah. Right? Right? Am I right? And then she's oh. getting it on with a candlestick. Don't Weird. open this up to people messaging and saying, no, they started off as humans or something and yeah. then something happened. Yeah, fuck off. Maybe a witch came in. <laughs> Maybe the beast had something to do with it. Did yeah, the beast fuck the cup? Is. The beast going around <laughs> fucking cups? <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> Whoa, what are you doing to us? <laughs> it's about time someone unfroze that bastard. The beast fucking <laughs> And asked him a few big questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Later. Bye.